Thank you all for joining. My name is Lakshya and I'm from the Women's Human Rights Education Institute. I am happy to welcome you all here today to discuss an important topic with distinguished international women's human rights experts. Today's topic is SIDA and COVID-19, Women's Human Rights Obligation and Visions for Change. We will begin with a panel discussion and um, we'll go into the Q&A later on. So I welcome you all. Um, I am gonna pass it on to Angela Lytle. Angela is the Executive Director of the Women's Human Rights Education Institute and she will be moderating our chat today. Uh, welcome, Angela. Thanks so much, Laksha. <laughs> Thank you for all your work to make this webinar possible today. On behalf of our team at the Women's Human Rights Education Institute, I'd like to thank our fantastic panelists and the large number of participants who've come out today for this important dialogue. At the Women's Human Rights Education Institute, our mission is to support capacity building and knowledge sharing amongst women's human rights defenders, using the International Framework for Women's Human Rights as a practical tool for advocacy, as well as a living framework that works in synergy with feminist visions for social change. We offer capacity building programs often conducted in partnership in a variety of locations around the world, as well as online. And we're so happy to convene this space here today. I'd like to give a special welcome to the many program alumni who are here today who've attended our programs as well as our partners. The idea for this webinar came out of an ongoing conversation that many of us have been having about the disproportionate impact of the COVID-19 crisis on women, exacerbated further for particular groups of women who are already living experiences of intersectional discrimination. We talked about a what if, what if CEDAW, the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which sets the standard for international women's human rights obligations and which is almost universally ratified by UN member states? What if it had been implemented or at least better implemented? What might things have looked like now? And what can we see and understand about the gendered impacts of the crisis by looking through the lens of CEDAW? both to illuminate the pre-existing inequalities and failures to meet obligations under the convention before this current crisis, as well as what CEDAW tells us about how to address it now, and what we can learn about what is needed to move forward in parallel on both acute current issues and also the longer term impacts of inequality. What does CEDAW tell us about what we need to build our world anew? And what tools does the international women's human rights system offer to support feminist advocacy and work for social change? We're so fortunate today to have three women's human rights experts with us to discuss these questions. The first part of the webinar will involve a panel discussion with our experts framed around a series of questions on this theme. After about 45 minutes of hearing from our panelists, we'll turn to the Q&A box and they'll have time to respond to questions posed by those of you watching today in as much as we're able to accommodate. So given the size of the group, we ask you to keep your questions for the panelists to the Q&A box and whatever parallel discussions in the chat window are welcome, um, but we probably won't see your questions unless they're in the Q&A box. So we thank you for understanding and I'd like to introduce our uh, three panelists today. First, we're very fortunate to have Ms. Hilary Badema who is currently chair of the CEDAW committee, which monitors the implementation of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. She is a lawyer, researcher, writer, and women's rights activist. She is rector and lecturer at the Law Institute, Ghana's premier vocational law training institute in Accra, and works on a range of human rights issues, including inheritance, property rights of spouses, women's equal representation, education, economic, of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls. The Working Group is one of the special procedures of the UN Human Rights Council, which is formed of a group of five independent experts or special rapporteurs that report to the Human Rights Council on a full range of women's human rights issues by conducting country visits, developing thematic reports, and accepting civil society communications. 
Alda is a Costa Rican feminist jurist and activist who has been working with CEDAW for decades, and she's also the co-founder of our Women's Human Rights Education Institute. We're also very pleased to have with us today Dr. Amanda Dale. Amanda is an international human rights scholar and activist with a specialization in access to justice and women's human rights. She is chair of the board of Interparies, Ex expert panel advisory member of the Canadian Femicide Observatory for Justice and Accountability, and also advisory panel member of the Canadian Center for Legal Innovation and Sexual Assault Law. Thank you for being here today, Amanda. <laughs> and so now let's begin our conversation. I'll start by posing a question and then we'll invite panelists to respond. So the first question we'd like to start with today is this. While some have called the virus the great equalizer, in truth, we've seen the disproportionate impacts of the virus on all women, but in particular on poor, racialized, migrant and indigenous women, women working in care and informal sector, women and girls in situations of domestic violence, elders, women with disabilities, LBT women, pregnant and birthing women, and so on. What is the importance of CEDAW's framework to our understanding of the COVID-19 crisis. And so I'd like to invite uh, Hilary to speak first. Thank you very much, uh, Angela. And uh, I'll begin by saying that I couldn't agree with you more that this virus has not equalized anyone. It has deepened the fault lines in our society and in the world order, and therefore, if we had a more robust implementation of CEDAW, a more vibrant ownership, better implementation of the CEDAW and dissemination, we would have covered a lot of grounds as far as equality is concerned and non-discrimination, which are at the heart of the convention and are contained in articles one and two of the convention. We would have had a world order already accepting of equality and non-discrimination and the impact of the uh, COVID-19 would not have been as debilitating as we see it now. CEDAW is the International Bill of Rights and as you have uh, remarked, uh, almost a total ratification. It deals with several aspects of women's lives, the convention that is, areas in which we tend to see discrimination. And in addition to the convention itself, we have fashioned general recommendations, which are the soft law that accompany the convention. Now, let me look at a few of the areas in which uh, the convention would have addressed inequalities. And now that we are where we are, we have developed guidelines to enable states navigate the human rights terrain during and post conflict COVID. Therefore, I will tend to emphasize the guidelines because they, they synchronize with the convention. As I've said, first of all, there are gross inequalities. You have mentioned various groups of women. These are groups of women we, de uh, we deal with under disadvantaged groups of women in our Article 14. And again, they are uh, referred to in our General Recommendation 28. So in our guidelines, we have asked for targeted measures for disadvantaged groups of women. And these include older women, women and girls with disability, migrant, refugee, internally displaced, indigenous, LGBT, uh, women deprived of liberty, humanitarian settings. We have dealt with this in the, in the uh, guidelines because we know that the impact will already be worth where there is intersectional discrimination on account of uh, maybe a poorer financial standing, access to services, ex existing discrimination. And for example, in areas of detention, uh, these are areas in which the virus can spread uh, faster. And uh, as I said, access to all the services that are needed by women and especially these groups of uh, women that you have outlined. So the, the guidelines address this. Then we look at other areas. For example, in the convention, we talk about equal representation of women in articles seven and eight, 
And where this does not happen, we ask for temporary special measures. Again, looking at the situation in the, occasioned by uh, COVID, we see that women are not engaged as much as they should be in decision-taking and in implementation. I had the advantage of looking at an article recently and that looked at uh, countries that are doing fairly well uh, as against the COVID. And most of them were countries that were headed by women. So this tells us something about women's participation, the leadership, the feminist uh, communication and uh, policy styles that they bring to these to, 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 uh, uh, crisis areas. In, in short, you talked about uh, Germany, New Zealand, Denmark, Taiwan, Norway, Iceland, and Finland. I, I think we have to commend good examples. And um, it talked about how they had uh, prioritized uh, human security, there were flexible policies, diverse and inclusive leadership, and transparency and flexibility. So the, this is about leadership. Then we look at the area of health. Uh, I need not repeat that women are frontline health uh, service uh, deliverers. They are the frontline, they are carers, and they are disproportionately, increasingly represented at the front line. The issues of whether they have adequate protection, and this is where protection is weakest, uh, PPEs and um, how they're getting their own psychosocial support for what they're dealing with is an area that uh, needs to be investigated, apart from the obvious that we all know. So what the implications are these guidelines, these guidelines have for us and for states is that one, it flags for states what they should be doing. Two, it questions the way we already do business. We cannot go and engage with states as usual. We've got to ask them, against the backdrop of COVID, how are you delivering on these mandates? Another important area is the area of um, uh, gender-based violence. We have seen increasing cases of gender-based violence against uh, women, uh, principally because of the isolation Women are living with their abusers. Also because of the lockdown, they cannot get access to report. Also against the backdrop of an already fragile system that does not respond that well to women, which is exacerbated by increased violence, less report. The interesting is that in some areas, we have more cases of men reporting, giving the impression that uh, they are probably receiving more violence. But what it has told, told us, looking beyond, the, looking beyond the data, is that they have more access to go out and report. So again, this is where one of the fault lines are, are exhibited, shown, portrayed, that the non-vibrant system is taking a hit uh, now. Then I would like to look at the issue area of socioeconomic support, uh, 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 support, let me put it that way, which is already in our articles 12 and 13 uh, in the Hello. convention. Thank you. And it is also dealt with in the guidelines. Here, we are asking states parties to look at the way women engage. Already they are in the precarious areas, They're the more easily laid off, the non-professional uh, areas, they're overrepresented there the vertical and horizontal representation of women in the workforce, uh, the uh, mark access to markets, and so on. And we ask that in COVID and post-COVID, the economic um, models should ensure that women are put at the forefront and given these uh, temporary special measures if need be. Let me just conclude with the last sentence on economic models. We know that the COVID has put strains on countries. So the area of uh, uh, sovereign debt borrowing is going to increase, is increasing. The result is that there'll be less spending on social services. And this is where women will get hit most. So if our models, our equality uh, framework are looking beyond um, equality to substantive equality had been uh, adhered to, would have had a more even playing field in the face of the pandemic. I thank you very much. And I also thank the listeners from all over the world who are tuned in to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hilary, for starting us off. I'd like to uh, turn the same question to Alda. 
Good morning, good afternoon. Here it's the morning in, in Costa Rica. Um, thank you, Hillary, for starting us off. And, and you said so many of the things that I was going to say, so I'm going to go into different, um, I'm taking a different track. I, I was going to, to, to say something about our statement, the working group on, the, on discrimination against women and girls did um, pu publicize a statement on, on COVID and women. And, and we did want to emphasize the fact that the COVID-19 was not creating uh, the, the discrimination against women or all the, the suffering that women uh, were, we were receiving in, in information that we were having, but more that it was exacerbating what already existed, what Hillary said, we, we are in, in a world that discriminates against women. And of course, any, anything that happens will impact women in, in, in a different and, and in many times in a worse way. So um, if, we had, if we had had that, um, if I want to talk about equality in the sense that of what the last thing that Hillary said, because this is what the excuse we always get, the justification for not doing things for women is to say there's not enough money. There's, you know, we're a poor country. Even the richest countries in the world say they don't have the, the, the money to do this or they don't have the money to have sh more shelters or to do. So we, we really need to, to think about um, what, what, does, what does equality mean? And it, it doesn't mean just throwing uh, money at women, but changing the whole structure of society. Changing, for example, uh, most states, no, in fact, I think all states would have money if they, if they would charge the big corporations the, the taxes that they should be paying you know, that, that, that are, they're always getting tax incentives. They're always getting um, amnesties for, for, you know, and now he, for example, they're here in Costa Rica, they're having amnesty for the big corporation because of the COVID-19, but no amnesty for the regular uh, people and, and the frontline workers, as, as Hillary said. So one of the first things we have to do is, is think about why, why there is no money, why there is money for, why so many, there's so many millionaires I mean, there's less and less millionaires, but more and more millionaire. <laughs> they, they, they get richer and richer every year, and something has to change. If that doesn't change, we'll never be able to get equality for, for women so, and for all women. So that is one thing that I, I really wanted to, to state because I think that there's a lot of misunderstanding of what equality means and, and what the state would really have to do to get equality for all women and when we say all women, we mean all women, racialized women, poor women, women with disabilities, migrant women, domestic workers, et cetera, and older women and younger women and little girls and babies. So if, if we wanted to really eliminate discrimination against all these women, I mean, if the states really did it, they would have to eliminate racism. They would have to eliminate ableism. They would have to eliminate ageism. So think about that. If we want to eliminate discrimination against all women, we need to dis eliminate dis race racism. We need to eliminate ageism. It, because there are women that, that, because of what we have known now as intersectionality, that, that women don't only suffer from discrimination on gender, on the basis of gender but the, and sex, but women suffer because of the intersection of gender and sex with uh, race and others. So if, if the CEDAW had been implemented before the COVID-19, we would be having a, probably a, a, you know, a pandemic. I don't say that it wouldn't have happened, but the, the situation would be so much better, right? There wouldn't be, there wouldn't be all this, um, what we are seeing in, 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 in the world of the police brutality, and the racism in the U.S. and, and other, in other parts, and why is it impacting uh, especially the poor and indigenous women in our part of the world? Uh, that's because there is inequality and that because there is discrimination. And, and really committing to eliminating discrimination means that it's not only the states. The states are the ones that are responsible for eliminating it. They have the obligation, but we all have to work on ourselves. We have to work on ourselves to eliminate the racism that we have in, 
incorporated in our thinking, in our way of looking at the world, in a way of analyzing the problems. We have to eliminate the ageism and the ableism. We have to eliminate so many things from, from our own world views that we have to, that, that's a lot of work. And I think that, that um, a, the problem, one of the problems is to always say the state is responsible and, and it's okay. So one of the problems that we have to really think about uh, when we, we think about how to improve women's lives is how to improve our worldview and our way and our attitudes and our conducts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Alda. We'll be able to come back around to some more of those themes in, in the, the uh, upcoming questions. Um, so for now, I'd like to move on to the next question to which I'll invite each of our speakers to respond. Um, the question we posed to each of the panelists today was we asked them to describe a particular example or examples of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on women and on women's human rights, and to look at that, how it might have been different if CEDAW had been implemented before the crisis, and what CEDAW says to us about how we need to respond to those particular issues now. So I'd like to invite uh, Amanda Dale to speak first, please. Thank you so much, Angela, for the question. And I'm just, uh, I just want to welcome everyone. And I see some familiar names um, and some amazing activists and thinkers who've joined us from all over the world. So thank you very much for joining us. It feels odd not to be able to speak directly with you. But in answer to your question, Angela, um, I guess what we're saying this morning, uh, all of us, is that CEDA is a vision uh, of a different world, but it's also a practical tool for states and advocates alike. And I guess these are the elements that I wanna to come to in answer to your question, because it's also, um, it should be seen as a legal obligation by states. And while states have ratified it um, almost uh, more than any other human rights treaty, they've also registered um, reservations. And those reservations often go to the heart of their discomfort with the very radical nature of how uh, anti-discrimination would look in their state as Alda has described it. So of course in some ways it's facile to say that if CEDAW had been implemented we would be living in a feminist utopia, but it's actually a comprehensive tool for mapping and implementing a gender equal world. And had it been taken seriously we might not be staring at these depressing and disproportionate results. And I'll take Canada as an example because Canada often gets trotted out and trots itself out as a great defender of human rights on the international stage. Um, and our Prime Minister has made much of his feminist perspective. However, um, CEDA in its last review of Canada really took it to task and said that in its country observations, it noted that the committee was concerned that the provisions of the convention, the optional protocol, and the committee's general, general recommendations were not sufficiently known by the state party and by women themselves within the state. So we're starting with um, a kind of disengagement and a perfunctory way of, of engaging with the bureaucracy as opposed to the, the substantive quality of the treaty's uh, obligations. And had CEDA's uh, recommendations been implemented in Canada, Canada would have organized its several, uh, I would say, failed attempts at initiating policy through the Women and Gender Equality uh, Ministry around and through CEDA, making good on its stated mission to have a cohesive and coordinated approach to women's equality. That has not happened. It has not transpired. And when COVID hit, all of those fault lines were then revealed. Um, had it had a substantive engagement with the mechanism and the many recommendations which detailed and really actually formed a kind of template for action for the state, we wouldn't have piecemeal and fragile infrastructure when COVID hit. We would have had investment in the women's sector, we would have had core funding, um, and in a really uh, important way, we wouldn't be making flash investments now in a rapid response to mitigate or appear to mitigate the worst aspects of the so-called pre-existing conditions, that is inequality, violation of women's uh, international human rights, 
that are exacerbated by COVID. So we would not have seen the shocking rates of increased gender-based violence compounding women's vulnerability to lethal violence by the shocking stay-at-home orders. Like that just would not have been a policy edict if there had been a true intersectional uh, and gender specific um, policy in place. It wouldn't have exacerbated the homelessness crisis, the, in, uh, the existing deferential death, base, uh, death rates based on housing, uh, access to clean water and food, um, and the clearly predictable result of uh, increasing abuse for women. And with uh, the last joint report uh, between um, a number of uh, Canadian organizations looked at the precarity of women uh, now who are employed in the sector, which I think Hillary referred to. Um, And those women are now uh, also extremely vulnerable, both to the virus itself and to other forms of abuse and violence and isolation. Had Canada responded substantively instead of perfunctorily to the last country observations of of 2016 or the 2012 views of the committee from individual communications jurisprudence, a national gender equality plan would have been well underway, many years under its belt. As part of this, two important sub-plans would have been underway. One was a national action plan on violence against Indigenous women and girls, and I'm going to speak more about this in a second and a national action plan on gender-based violence. The state would have had eight years to act and would have recruited and trained more indigenous women to provide legal aid to women from their communities, uh, including domestic violence cases and property rights cases. Um, And it would have reviewed its legal aid scheme to ensure that indigenous women who are victims of violence had effective access to justice. It would have enacted a credible mechanism to monitor and hold accountable Canadian corporations who are operating abroad and who are complicit in or directly involved in the violation of women's human rights. Instead, it has fumbled the ball on this and the credible human rights organizations following and monitoring this implementation have left the table. The state would have developed a comprehensive national gender strategy, policy and action plan addressing the, the structural factors that cause persistent inequalities Uh, including with special focus on girls uh, and women and girls with disabilities, those who are single parents, Indigenous, Afro-Canadian, migrant, refugee, asylum-seeking, lesbian, gay, um, bisexual and trans women, and intersex persons. Those are all clear policy requirements that came out of the last review from CEDAW. And most shocking, it would, it would have ensured that women's organizations, indigenous women's organizations would have been included in the countrywide nation to nation relationship between the Canadian state and indigenous governance. And only one of the CEDAW optional protocol eight inquiries into Canada's record on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls was implemented. And that was step one to hold a national inquiry. None of the national inquiry um, 200 and some odd recommendations have been implemented. Canada has had since 2015, when CEDAW issued its optional protocol report to act. And it, you know, it, it noted again with concern in 2016, the absence of any coordinated mechanism to oversee the implementation of 37 recommendations coming from CEDAW itself. So in that context, we instead, thank you, Angela, in that context, we instead have a failing grade uh, issued by the National, uh, the Native Women's Association of Canada. Um, and it, it called uh, its review, its report card of, ca- of the Canadian state on this a resounding fail. So still, I believe we have in hand in CEDAW an opportunity to learn from what has happened with COVID. Number one is the government can act when needed, as Alda mentioned. Um, It took the pandemic, um, this particular pandemic took precedence over other pandemics, such as racism and indigenous uh, genocide and gender-based violence. Um, We could come back to that uh, equation and reverse um, the onus on government. And this X-ray uh, that it applied to the existing inequalities means that we have a brief opening 
and the uprising against racism and colonial control that we're seeing and against the, the militarization of police, I think is our opening. Um, and these, and CEDA also works in concert with other international human rights protections. And I think we need to look at how we strategically use all of those protections to shore up the core values of CEDA. So UNDRIP is very important to the indigenous women's uh, rights movement in Canada. Um, the Universal Periodic Review underscored a lot of Canada's uh, breaches. Um, so all of these things I think we need to come back to uh, as we discuss how to move forward in a positive way. Thanks, Angela. Thank you very much, Amanda. Um, continuing uh, with, the, with the same question um, around examples and how things might have been different and how we need to respond to those issues, um, why don't I invite Hillary to speak now? Thank you very much. Um, I will focus this intervention on um, COVID and education, especially as we have it in the convention and in our general recommendation 36 on the right of girls and women to education. Now with the COVID, the impact on education has been across the entire spectrum, both vertically and horizontally. First of all, the majority of teachers in most countries at the basic level are women. And with this, we can see precarity in employment being hit by COVID. When we reopen, these are the people who are not only going to be teachers, but are going to be health workers also because they're going to be alert for uh, issues of COVID in their classrooms. So we put a double burden on, on teachers. First of all, as I said, the overrepresentation at the lower levels where resources are fewer, where less attention is paid in, more, in a lot of countries. Uh, so that is it. Now, secondly, for parents in the area of the lockdown, they now have to look after children at home. So parents have compulsorily become teachers. And in most cases, it is mothers. That has an impact, first of all, on their own career advancement, because now they have to sacrifice the time for children. There's no availability, not wide availability of childcare. And even if there were, it would not be affordable. Even if it were affordable, there's also always the risk of, is this the route through which infection is going to come to my house? So women have now been forced to give up some of their uh, work to pick up the, 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 the slack in the education field at all. And the women who are not uh, maybe well positioned to educate their children have a sense of disadvantage as well. When we come to the uh, learners, the, 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 the students in the schools, and especially women, because this is where our mandate is. Now with the lockdown school closure, we have a whole range of uh, girls and young adolescents at home. I've dealt a little bit with the younger ones. Let, let me focus now on the adolescents. They are more likely to fall back into the typical feminine roles at home. They are devoid of the protective space that school affords. So for the six hours they would be in school, they're now at home and they're likely to be doing chores. And in some areas, these chores can be really uh, oppressive. Uh, Secondly, there's the increased risk of uh, teenage or early pregnancy in some jurisdictions. There may, there may be child marriages and so on. So there is a risk of attrition, non-return to school. And for us in the committee, this gives us an additional task. Post-COVID, we are not only going to ask how many girls and boys are enrolled or attend, but how many came back after COVID and have you traced those who did not come back? So that, that is another aspect. And another part of the loss of uh, the prote school protective space is that for a lot of parents and uh, young, uh, young children also, school is also a place where they have free meals. Now this burden falls back onto the parents and it's an additional economic, reverse economic uh, uh, burden. I will look at the issue of access to technology, which we have dealt with in our 
General Recommendation 36, the access to technology in learning, and that uh, this should be standard. But we know it has not been. Had it been, we would have had the resilience that technology affords. As it is now, it is the better place schools who are using technology to educate while there's the lockdown and schools are closed. And the schools that are disadvantaged by where they're situated, whether rural, urban, or inner city, or uh, poverty rates, have no or very little access to education at this time. So they are losing uh, education. Now again with technology, the issue is, have we built firewalls around the technological space, cyberbullying and so on, especially since for a lot of schools, this is the first time they're experiencing, they're dealing with technology in this, uh, in this uh, manner. So these are issues that we also have to uh, look at. So um, we also, because of the, the changes the, in paradigm that have occurred, different experiences of young girls, especially adolescents during this time, when we come back, when schools reopen, there is the issue of the relevance of the syllabus. Uh, relevant to some of the experiences they may have had during this period, these have to be harvested and put into the syllabus to make it re uh, relevant. We cannot run away from the fact that we may have to deal with comprehensive sexuality education in a more decisive way than we ever have, have, have had, because these are some of the exposures that uh, we would have seen our girls have. We would have to be uh, firmer, we'd have to pay more attention to their psychological integrity. Some of them would have gone through lots of things, uh, seemingly innocuous change of roles during this period. How is it going to be built in the syllabus? We also have to look at ways in which those who have been disadvantaged can catch up so that the, 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 the cracks that have been widened by the lockdown in schools will be uh, closed in a very equitable and equal way. Just to conclude, in our general recommendation, we have pillars. We talk about the three A's, accessibility, affordability, availability, and the acceptability of education. It becomes even more important post uh, reopening. Secondly, we talk about access to education com comprising the psychological access also. We've got to pay more attention to this after uh, uh, COVID. We talk about rights within education, the experiences within the educational sector. We have to look at it. And finally, we look at rights through education. What is it that we want girls to get out of education that translates and gives the benefit of the education equally with men or boys? This is an aspect we have to pay firmer attention to when schools reopen. So in short, our convention gives us the roadmap. Our general recommendation digs in and we expect a more uh, robust um, implementation of our jurisprudence to make education meaningful, free of discrimination, and able to bring the developmental advantages which is supposed to be, because it is a human right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. You drew a beautiful picture there of the, the interconnectedness <laughs> of all of the rights and the, the chain reaction that happens, right, with the, with, with the instance of a particular um, shift, right, and the chain reaction that results in the lack of rights fulfillment. So thank you. Um, I'll open up the same question to Alda to speak from her context and perspective. I remind you to unmute yourself. Well, every time I listen to Hillary, I want to I want to keep talking about what she started talking. But I just want to say, with 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 the education, that if if we had um, implemented a non discriminatory education and the content of education, we would all be much more aware of sexism and racism and all that. It's because in the in the schools, children don't learn about how racism racism came about. Why? What is sexism? When did patriarchy start? None of that is, is taught in school. So I think that we should take this opportunity after COVID to really uh, insist on these things that have to be incorporated into the substance of history, social studies, etc. 
and if, and then again, talking about if CEDAW had been implemented with respect, for example, to Article 12, access to health, uh, we would have a completely different health system in most countries. And, 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 and there would be access, uh, one, for one, there would be universal access to, to health services because uh, that is something that, that is needed for, for people to be able to really enjoy uh, the right to health. But also we would understand that there are different forms of of understandings of what health is. And for example, uh, the indigenous uh, tradition of health that takes it a much more integral holistic approach to the body and the soul and the, and the mind is something that, that would be more uh, considered and taken into account. Um, and with, the, with this respect to what we have received the many communications with on the issue of, of all of the reproductive rights, the, the, because of COVID-19, already rights that were not very recognized or, or, or fully recognized have been even more um, denied or more barriers put to women. And we've seen many countries that are taking advantage of the, of the COVID-19 to even to put more barriers on access to reproductive rights, access to, well, the one that everybody, you know, is always so, so uh, scared about. I mean, all the conservatives about abortion, that there's so many states that are making abortion even more difficult for women in, the, in countries that, such as mine in my area where abortion is, is illegal, it's criminalized, it's even harder now, right, to, to be able to access it. But those countries where it was decriminalized have have started movements to criminalize abortion again but not only abortion i mean reproductive rights are much wider than than access to abortion right they're ac access to to birthing to and and have access to hospitals when you're when you're birthing if that is what you 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 want and and in in many many countries that we have we have heard from there are you know women are being subjected to cesarean uh, birthing because to make it quicker and get them out of the hospital or the children are separated from the, the babies that are born are separated from the mother immediately so that there won't, there won't be any contamination. And that will have lasting effects on the, on the, on the, the future generations, right? Of children that were completely separated from their, from their mother at, from, from birth. And, and just the, the, all the, the excuses that in many of our governments in Latin America are using to, to fire women that are pregnant or have small babies so that they, um, saying that they don't have the money to, to, to have, uh, you know, to care for the women that, that need all the care. If, if CEDAW had been implemented, reproductive rights would be maybe the most important rights. We would have a society that thinks that, 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 that has at the center of its, of, its, of its functioning the care and reproduction of life instead of the production of, of things, right? So we would, have, we would have, there would be like special places, even almost chapels for birthing, right? Where, where that is the most important act that you can do as a human being is to, to create another human being and, and, and care for that, for that for that other human being, but we have no, no respect for that, for that, for that act of birthing, right? We have, we've made it in countries, in so-called richer countries, they've medicalized it to the point where women are just completely separated from the, from the fantastic, almost sacred act of birthing to, to just like a, a medical procedure and, and, and where women have no say. And in countries where there is no, um, the hospitalization as much it's still you know the the dip, very difficult to to find that this this act of birthing is is central to the maintenance of of humanity and and uh, I think that that's one of the things that that we could learn to read CEDAW in a visionary way learn to read it it's okay so we if, so if women should have access to health in a non-discriminatory manner, what has to change? All the things that have to change is, as Hillary was talking about education, we could do that with every single article, right? With, 
with and and see what has to change in the in the in in our concept of health what has to change in the services that are called health services what has to change in the way we eat in the way we talk in the way so many things that we can use uh, and for me CEDO has is that it's a visionary tool that helps you understand more than making plans by government it's changing the way we understand our lives and and what kind of society we want I will leave it there. Okay. Thank you, Alda, and thank you to all of you for your responses um, to that question. And I think the comments have highlighted, you know, some of the key uh, themes that we hope to touch upon, as well as, you know, what's really important to take away from the conversation today. And one is the, the legal and practical power of CEDAW as an advocacy tool, as a set of obligations that are, are, are already defined, where there's a living praxis with the committee, um, you know, constantly um, giving recommendations to states on what they've already agreed to, what they're already obligated for, and the way that we can um, connect through our advocacy in order to make change using CEDAW. Um, but also the importance of CEDAW as a tool for that holistic analysis, right? Both within the process of the constructive dialogue, you know, reviewing the country directly, but also for us to use and to understand the interconnected nature of rights and also the interconnected nature of the way that one violation <laughs> can impact all areas of our lives, right? And that's, you know, part of the power of the convention is that there's no piecemeal approach possible, right? The underlying discrimination and inequality that is there has to be holistically addressed because it infiltrates all aspects of our lives and impacts all of the way that, that women um, are able to enjoy or not enjoy their rights. Um, I had more questions <laughs> that I would love to um, uh, ask the panelists myself, but I think at this point, um, maybe what I'll do is, is put a pause on myself and um, start to turn um, to a few of the questions that we've uh, received in the chat box um, so that we can uh, address some of our, our, our participants' um, queries today. So the first uh, question um, that we got a little bit earlier was specifically in reference to the, um, the guidelines um, issued uh, by the CEDAW committee that Hillary referred to um, around COVID-19 for states um, and asking about um, whether um, either the absence of or the way in which uh, women's lands, land rights um, are um, protected and what the, what the committee sees, and in particular Hillary is the panelist, how does CEDAW um, approach in the COVID-19 um, context as well, women's land rights and women's land rights in general? So I think that's a specific question for you, Hillary. I'll turn it over to you for a couple of minutes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, land rights cut across several of the, uh, the articles of the convention. First of all, let me look at it as um, an issue of equality and non-discrimination. In some jurisdictions, land is an area where you see one of the greatest inequalities against uh, women. Women are just not permitted to own land. It may be a very overt declaration, or it may be covert. The customs, the usages, and the dynamics are such that women cannot own that. So first of all, it's a question of equality, simplicity. This is a convention that uh, uh, demands equality of rights between men and women. Secondly, land is also an issue around economic rights. So the ability to uh, access land is linked to your economic equality and integrity. So in this area, land rights is dealt with maybe more under Article 14, uh, 13, 13 and 14, 14 in the sense of uh, the uh, rural, rural women, where we see land rights and injustices in relation to corporations, extractives, 
extraterritorial responsibility, and so on. And in that context also, we look at the rights of the indigenous people around their land. So that is another way in which land is dealt with. Land is also dealt with, again, when we come to Article 16 on family rights and uh, uh, rights to family property, where the issue of uh, determination of the uh, usually women's access to marital property vis-a-vis -vis land is contested. So we see it in that context also. So all in all, these are the areas in which we land rights are, are looked at, but the position of the convention is one of equality, that women need to have their rights to land in the same way as a matter of equality, as a matter of economic exigency, as a matter of uh, rights to matrimonial property. I don't know if I've answered um, the questioner adequately, but it's because it's so multifaceted. And uh, the bottom line is equality, and we ask states to ensure that there are no barriers to women's access to land. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot, there's one more. Uh, we also recognize the position of women as producers of food and that they, they, they need secure titles in order to continue to pro, uh, produce the food that most of us uh, consume, especially in my part of the world. Women form a bulk of the subsistence farmers. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hillary. The next question um, I'll turn to, um, I think this is a question um, for Alda, but of course anybody would be welcome to speak to it. Um, you referred to the power imbalance that, that capitalism creates and perpetuates and the COVID-19 crisis has you know, brought that to the forefront again. Um, to survive in this capitalist world, we often have to play by, with, or around capitalist rules and their economic models. So the question is, where is the line of playing by capitalist rules and fighting it? And how can we utilize CEDAW specifically in the fight against um, capitalism? Alda, do you want to speak to that one? Yeah, I think that, that that's a good, good question. I just want to say before I go into that one that uh, the working group has a position paper on land rights. So you're invited, you can go check in our website and we have a, a whole um, description of what, why land rights, uh, women should, do have land rights according to CEDAW and according to human rights standards. So, so check, check that out. And, and, I, and I, I want to, to, talking about land rights, but any other right, CEDAW doesn't talk about every single right. It doesn't talk, for example, about there's no article on access to justice, right? But there's a general recommendation on access to justice. And it's the way of, if you read the general recommendations, you can learn how to read the CEDAW so that it does include any, any aspect that has discrimination against women. Any, any, any element that produces discrimination against women, CEDAW covers. You just have to read it like, as, as Hillary was explaining, read it in several articles. Not, there's not going to be one article that talks about every single issue but there but you can get to to the issue by reading several articles together and especially article one that talks about uh, the prohibition of discrimination so if if if, if discrimination women are suffering discrimination and in access to land rights that is prohibited by CEDAW and uh, so to the other thing that, that yes it's what what I what I think that that CEDAW if used correctly, we could lobby to, to eliminate a lot of the negative impacts of capitalism, right? Because you, would, it, you cannot have equality in capitalism. That, that is it's absolutely impossible. And it's not that I think about, I think that, it's that it, you can see it. That is the product of, of any capitalist society is inequality. It, it, it starts just allowing so many people to have... Uh, so rich and the rest of the people being so poor is just completely contrary to equality. And, and, um, and so 
I know that for, for many people talking against capitalism makes them nervous, but that, that is, is, if you really think about it, and I invite you to think about it, how can you have equality when, when there is so much inequality just in the way capitalism functions and the way, the way they, they have um, so many advantages, the, 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 the rich have so many advantages with respect to the poor people. And the poor people usually are women, right? So, so that, that, that has to do with discrimination against women. And, 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 and as I was saying before, if, if CEDAW had been implemented, if, if, if states had taken their obligations seriously, they would have to have uh, treat uh, foreign investors the big corporations, the mining companies, they would have to be, have a completely different treatment. They would have to have more, more um, re rules on how to, how to work uh, within. So, but the question is, um, how, do you, how do you draw the line? Where, where do, you, do you, are you fomenting, fomenting, my English today is terrible, it's too early in the morning. Um, that it, it uh, I think that's something that we just have to, have to, uh, think every time. What what are you going to support? Uh, usually, everything that we do in some way supports capitalism. To get equality, we need we need to not completely not completely destroy a lot of capitalist um, institutions. But we have to critique them. We have to look for ways that can that we can that they can act differently and start putting some some obligations on them because for, for now uh, corporations have been left you know out of the obligations to to for equality there there there's because of the way we the human rights theory came about it's thinking of the states but there's so many international uh, multinational corporations that are much stronger more powerful and have much more money than states so we have to find that balance again. We, or, or things change, right? When, when, when human rights theory was, was thought about and developed, there, was, there wasn't any corporations that were that strong as they are now, right? That there, were, there weren't the billionaires that we have now. So we, since the situation has changed, we have to also adapt human rights uh, to, to what is happening. And I think we have to start demanding that, that corporations do their part if they want to continue uh, to exist. Thank you, Alda. Hillary, did you want to add anything to that from the committee's perspective or shall I move on? Okay, great, thank you. Um, I have um, uh, two questions here that I think I'm going to uh, put together. Um, one growing out of the other, perhaps, and invite um, 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 Amanda to speak. So the, the first question says, COVID-19 has not been an equalizer, but it does have the potential to accelerate equality given that it has exposed the fault lines and forced society at large to confront gender inequality in all its forms. So the question is specifically, what recommendations do panelists have for women's rights organizations? on organizing, programming, strategy, et cetera, to ensure we don't miss this window of opportunity. And there's a specific question to Amanda um, that asks about the possibility for Canadian civil society to advocate for effective implementation of the National Action Plan on Indigenous Women and Women of Colour, and whether you've come across alliances between different organizations or institutions in implementation of the CEDAW recommendations to Canada. Um, so, um, can I throw both of those to you at once? Yeah. Sure. Sure. No, I, I, I agree. Uh, otherwise, I wouldn't get up in the morning. I agree that um, we always have windows of opportunity. They, they are sometimes wider or narrower. Um, and um, I think, you know, backlash has been uh, accompanying us for many years now. And I think also we have to understand that in times of crisis, human rights backlashes are predictable and that the clawing back of rights in the name of the crisis will often make it more difficult for us to open up uh, those rights spaces again. 
But in the context that I'm in, uh, in North America, we're also seeing an unprecedented outpouring of outrage at the levels of inequality. Um, and we're seeing it specifically in relation to the violence the state perpetrates through its police forces against black people, indigenous people, and other peoples of color. Um, and I think this has been a huge uh, galvanizing moment uh, for many activists who've been, uh, you know, concerned with living with and fighting this for a very, very long time. Um, so I think there is some galvanizing potential here. And I think um, the anti-racist arm and the more intersectional arm of the women's movement is engaged in that struggle as well. And I think CEDA is, um, to me, it's always been the logical tool to, um, to envision and to frame uh, these kinds of interventions. So I think it does have a role in organizing our thinking. And as Hillary illustrated through her eloquent um, recitation of some of the articles and how they filter into all aspects of life, that all of the articles um, have that potential. And I think the, what Alda's referring to in terms of the overarching anti-discriminatory impulse of the treaty as a whole um, means we have a principle to work with that we can apply in all of those contexts. And, and CETA has reinterpreted all of its articles through the lens of intersectionality quite eloquently. Um, and I, I invite again, as Alda has underscored, use the general recommendations to deepen your understanding of what the meaning of the treaty is. So General Recommendation 35 is a particularly good example of revisiting how the intersection between uh, violence against women and other forms of discrimination have to be taken into account by states who have signed the treaty. And I think, you know, delving into that, um, which we don't have time to, for me to do verbally now, but certainly that material is there and ripe for the, for the use of advocates. I think in Canada, there's always been a very strong Indigenous women's movement um, that has been discounted at times by the male leadership of the Indigenous uh, governments uh, that were set up under colonial structures, and at times um, uh, certainly by the mainstream Canadian public, certainly by the state, uh, and at times by the, the mainstream white women's movement, I would say. And so one of the things that's happened uh, in the last uh, several years is a, an um, unavoidable discussion of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and that was in large part because of the amplification Indigenous women were able to achieve through CEDAW and through optional protocol and Article 8 of that protocol. So Canada is one of the very few states that has been investigated by CEDAW for gross human rights violations of women. Um, and that's a, that, that is not a proud moniker for Canada. And Canada had to deal with its shame on the international stage in relation to the violation of Indigenous women's rights. So I think um, CEDAW was very intricately involved in uh, the amplification of the rights of Indigenous women and their own uh, organizing and movement. Um, that movement is still in dialogue with the government. Oh, I, I, I don't want to say that that story is over yet, but it has been a year um, since the report, the National Inquiry report was released. And it's a very disappointing result to see them, the federal government still sort of waffling around on this. Um, Indigenous women's organizations have been uh, doing the work. I mean, they are healing their communities. They're central in their communities. They have been responding to COVID. They have been um, mounting campaigns on uh, changing the image of Indigenous women, the kind of sexist racism that we see perpetrated against Indigenous women that allows these kinds of um, uh, forms of violence against them. Indigenous people have been fighting against police brutality. Um, indigenous people have been, and Indigenous women in particular, have been asking for the legal framework that came out of um, the, the inquiry report. Um, there have been some achievements on uh, equality measures that were overt discrimination that have been reversed uh, in law since uh, the inquiry report was issued. So 
Um, I don't want to make it sound like nothing has happened. Uh, certainly on the activist side, lots has happened. Um, it, it's the incompleteness, the uncoordinatedness, and uh, the lack, I guess, of political will to do something substantive. There's a lot of appearances of supporting those rights and, and very little substantive engagement. And that's where I was coming from at the beginning when I talked about if one engaged with CEDA substantively, um, we would be in a very, very different place. And I think, um, I, I, you know, when I, was, when I was thinking about speaking this morning and I was thinking of um, how CEDA, you know, was written in an era, was written, really written between 1979 and 1981. And so the, the general recommendations are really the way to see how it's reinterpreted for the modern context and for the way we think of things now. But if you go back to the preamble, it foresaw a lot of the things we're talking about now. And it, it, it says, it, you know, the preamble says, concerned that in situations of poverty, women have less access to food, health, education, training, and opportunities for employment and other needs. That's what we've talked about here about COVID. So that's all right there. Um, convinced that the establishment of a new international economic order based on equity and justice will contribute significantly towards the promotion of equality between men and women. Well, that's what Alda was just drawing our attention to. And that's right in the preamble. Emphasizing that the eradication of apartheid and all forms of racism, racial discrimination, colonialism, neo-colonialism, aggression, foreign occupation and domination and interference in the internal affairs of states is essential to the full enjoyment of the rights of women, men and women. Well, these are all the things that we have been talking about this morning. And, you know, CEDAW envisioned those things. CEDAW, even though it sounds very high level, we've talked at a granular level about how these things are playing out right now in this crisis. And I think that is where I get my inspiration to keep going back to CEDAW, that there's a timelessness to um, those elements that we need to appeal to now and we need to force, I think our frameworks in our national women's rights movements could benefit from the organizing principles of those articles. Thank you, Amanda. Often people skip past the preamble and go right into the article. So it's really important to point us back always to how comprehensive the vision is. Um, there's a few questions here um, that I'm going to amalgamate into a single question that um, I'll put back to the panelists, um, which is largely around um, understanding the vision and the potential, but the fact of the matter is that often um, governments don't want to listen or don't want to act. Um, on their obligations. So we have a couple questions about what can we do? How can CEDAW help women and girls if governments don't want to listen? Or, um, you know, what is it that we need to do now specifically to make things happen when there's so much uh, resistance um, on governments? What kind of influence does the CEDAW committee have to act if governments don't fulfill their obligations? Um, Hillary, do you want to speak to that one in particular, or or Alda, or we'll go with Hillary. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, and um, thank you to the previous uh, panelists. Indeed, uh, CEDA must be seen as a totality, and this is why at the beginning I talked about the dissemination and the ownership, and um, the more robust implementation. Alda spoke about um, state responsibility, which is in Article 2, and our general recommendation 28, which I also referred to. And I think these are starting points, a state responsibility. Now, in our concluding observations, we always have a paragraph that says that the, the concluding observations must be disseminated to parliaments, to the judiciary, to academia, a whole host of stakeholders there. So this is where I will begin from. We, are, we have access to the concluding observations. That those are the statements and the recommendations we issue after we have engaged with the state in constructive dialogue. So I will uh, encourage everyone 
to look up those concluding observations after the state has engaged with the committee, especially our CSOs, and to use them as points of advocacy and as engagement with all the stakeholders. That is the first, uh, that is the first level. Secondly, uh, there was a question about the role of the movements. This is a, a, a rough time, but it is also an opportune time for mobilizing. And I think that we can mobilize around the issues that are dear to us, depending on the work that the, we do. In a manner of speaking, as I said, it's a hard time. But never in our lives have we used technology as we have used now. And the use of technology to, to, to mobilize, to put things across, is something that we must also capitalize on. So voice, I'm talking about voice now. Now, thirdly, I would like to talk about innovation. There are um, low-lying fruit, again, occasioned by the COVID that we can engage on. There are always consultations going on on how this should be done, how the other should be done. We must put our foot in the door and insist on being heard. And as I said, technology makes things so much easier. Thirdly, or fourthly, I will talk about the importance of data and research. Uh, COVID-19 opens up a door for us to reassess the discrimination suffered by women. It gives us the opportunity to retake statistics, uh, do research, uh, put out questions, and find out how the COVID is affecting women and use this as advocacy tools and to get into the door, especially the door of economic recovery. Let me stress this point because uh, this is a, a place where women are underserved and underrepresented. The COVID-19 gives us opportunities. The stimulus packages, and this is, these are some of the areas in which our voice should be going into and which uh, uh, coincide with the uh, convention. Uh, areas women could engage in. I've always talked about the production of, uh, of uh, sanitizers and face masks and so on. Uh, which are at levels that women are already operating. In. I'm not saying women should remain at these levels, and this is why I call them low. Uh, so I've come full circle. How do we make our governments listen? The convention, the jurisprudence, the software. Secondly, the concluding observations. Thirdly, strategic mobilization. Fourth, voice. Fifth, capture the concrete opportunity. Thank you, Hilary. Alda, I think you wanted to respond to that as well. Yes, well, Hilary has covered it, but I, I do want to say that it's that CEDA can help us uh, for movement building to understand the, the for example, what, what certain groups of women, uh, how they're living, how they're being discriminated. We don't always know every, every detail, but in the shadow reports and in the way they can they can explain how discrimination plays out in their in their groups. We can learn from it and make it a a, a, a movement against all forms of discrimination and not just against certain groups of, of women. So if we understand like the integrity of it and the and the intersection of different forms of discrimination, we we can really create a very strong movement as like the movement that we're seeing. In, in, in especially in the U.S. now against racism, right? People are understanding, I think, one of the, the benefits of, the, of this, of the police brutality with, with, with uh, Floyd has been that now people cannot deny that there's racism. And I mean, more, any, any person that really is, is, is analytical. And this happens with, with, with uh, sexism. S still so many women, in, at least in my part of the world, deny that there's discrimination. They think that what they're living, they'll say, yes, I, you know, I'm, I have suffered violence sometimes, I have this, but that's not discrimination. That's just the way things are. That's the way God made things, you know? So, so if we can 
using CEDAW, we can prove that there is discrimination and, and make women and men really not accepting of discrimination, you know, to really, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable uh, behavior. This is not acceptable uh, conduct by the state. And, and I think that that is very important because it, it, it makes it, if we can make people understand that there is not one form of discrimination that's more important or that you can el eliminate first and then eliminate the others. You can't. You cannot eliminate discrimination against, against women on the basis of sex without eliminating discrimination on the basis of race or on the basis of, of um, ableism or age, etc. So this is really very important to, to understand. I don't think, I mean, we understand the words, but I don't think we understand it in our hearts. I don't think that, that it, it really goes into, and this is something we, we can do. And to the other question of, of what, um, this, what opportunity does the COVID uh, give us is, is, is that we can now have very concrete uh, proof that discrimination against women exists, that something like a, a pandemic does affect women differently because of the structural inequalities that exist. And, and because sex is not taken into account. The, the biological differences between men and women are hardly ever taken into account. And that has, to be, that has to be put center stage again. And so I think that we, we, we have to use this moment to, to stop the backlashes. And in this area of, of the world, for example, governments are, it, the, the government of Guatemala is taking the opportunity to to close down the, the women's machinery instead of thinking, well, we really need now. We, now we need a women's machinery. They're, they're closing it down, and and in in Mexico they're closing down the 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 women's indigenous women's uh, centers where that really help indigenous women against violence and and with so many things and the poverty and the land access to land, etc. So we really have to see this as. A woman's issue, you know, that fact that that um, the w indigenous women's centers are being closed. It's not only indigenous women that have to fight against that. It's all women. We have to fight against that because that will will also affect us, and and to, and 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 be more practical because I've heard a lot of 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 women from Guatemala saying, "Oh, but the Supreme doesn't do anything anyway. You know, the women's machinery is no good. So wh who cares if they close it?" It, well, it, it, they should care. They should care if there's no machinery that will at least do the minimum, what, what will happen if, there isn't, if, if that doesn't exist? And CEDAW also demands that there is a, a machinery for women, that, that there is some part of a government that is focusing on, on what is happening to women. That is, that is part of, of implementing CEDAW. So again, CEDA is just this fantastic instrument that if you read it together with, with, with the general recommendations, you will see that you can, you can have all of your issues taken up by CEDA. Thank you, Alda. Um, we're, we're starting to get uh, close to our time. So I, I'd like to voice maybe one last question. Um, we have a number of different questions that we won't be able to specifically get to um, a number around some of the issues around intersectional discrimination and the particular um, enforced vulnerabilities created by discriminatory societies. So for example, questions around um, government uh, accountability for accessibility to women and girls with disabilities, disproportionate impact on you know, migrant workers and so on and so forth. Um, in the context of taking into account, you know, there's, there's a wide range of issues that we could certainly spend a webinar discussing the ins and outs of each. Um, but we had a question um, asking the panel if somebody could provide specific examples of special temporary measures that we should be demanding in women's movements to help build a foundation for transformative changes in the recovery phase. Um, so maybe we can take that as our last question. We have, um, maybe you can have a short response. We'll start with Amanda and then open it up to uh, Hillary and Alda um, to make some final comments there. Amanda? So um, I'll try to be super brief. So I have a couple of um, more practical, I guess, um, suggestions. So one is, 
using the language of CEDA and the UN is, uh, it takes time to transform the national uh, dialogue, but I have seen a shift, for instance, in Canada from talking about violence against women as if it were a one-off um, private event to we now have imported the language of a pandemic. And using this pandemic to talk about that pandemic has actually forced uh, a focus. And that pandemic was declared in 2013 by UN. So I, I've been using that word since 2013, and it's taken until this year for me to hear it echoed both from other women in the movement and in the press who interview me for these kinds of discussions. So that's, that's a practical element that comes out of our activism. In terms of temporary special measures, I think I put something in the chat, which was we're in the movement here in Canada starting to use the phrase she covery which in English works, but doesn't work in every language. But for us, it's a temporary special measure for the entire economy. That means you look at da the data that, that Hillary referred to shows clearly the impact on uh, those positions that are 80% occupied by women is far greater. Plus women are uh, more exposed to the virus because of those positions. So we've demanded a she covery. And that means that the, the investments, instead of going into the usual kinds of like roads, bridges, the usual kind of stimulus that governments engage in, which em employ men predominantly, we're asking for an investment in those parts of the economy that employ women. So those are sort of two practical examples answering the questions that have come uh, in, the, in the chat. Thank you, Angela. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Hillary? From the committee's perspectives, temporary special measures can be used in any sector where women are underserved, underrepresented, and uh, where we need to give women, or to give the uh, women, in this case, the disadvantaged group women, we need to give them the impetus to achieve the equality with men. And there are so many examples, non-exhaustive -exha ex examples given in the general recommendation that speaks on the TSMs, temporary special measures. So I don't know whether I can give a one size fits all answer, but what I would say is wherever that disadvantage is, and that disadvantage would certainly be supported by data. That is the entry point for the activism and the advocacy to bring the change that one wants to see. In the area of land, uh, I am aware of, uh, because of the interaction with uh, countries, uh, state parties that come before us, for some of their land and housing policy, poli ha land and housing allocation policies. There is a clear quota that is attributed or uh, given to women. So that is one way of going about land for and housing for women. The tricky thing about land is that you have to be extra careful to make sure that if it's land for agriculture, it is useful. So you, you have to do that, uh, that digging and that assurance and um, it is accessible and so on, and that there are resources to work the land. So when we must look at the package as a whole, as a continuum, and ensure that the temporary special measures target all the essential milestones or post uh, signposts in that, in that arena. So that is, for, that is what I can say for land. Uh, we have seen the same thing in the positions women occupy. We have seen the same thing in uh, economic, um, e economic interventions. And that is why I was uh, talking about procurement and the stimulus packages, ensure that whatever is out there has a quota or proportion for women in areas that women can function in immediately or can be trained to function in or in, in terms of proportionality. And I think uh, Amanda has given us some good examples. So uh, it's a difficult thing to give a one size fits all. I've given some uh, pointers 
And uh, I just want to assure uh, those who are with us here that temporary special measures can apply to any sector. Thank you. Thank you, Hillary. Alda? Well, I think Amanda and Hillary have, have covered pretty well. I would just give a caveat that temporary special measures usually create a lot of resistance from, from men and, 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 and women because they feel that they're being sort of treated unequally. And so I, I think that when, what Hillary said is really important if you have the data to prove that there is disadvantage to women in, 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 in wherever you're going to do the, the temporary special measures, that you keep that all the time, you know, talking about that disadvantage because otherwise uh, it just might backfire and it'll be worse for women than, than it was at, at, at the beginning. So just, just to show, but again, using the COVID-19, we now have so much evidence of, of the, the data that, that shows the discrimination against women or, or of those services that are mainly women employed, right? So that like all the, all the care services, all the, the health services, education, we, those have to be, those are places where women are mo mostly there and where they're, they are discriminated. Thank you, Alda. Um, may, may I say something? Please. Thank you. I think the messaging in temporary special measures is very important. Um, the way we package the advocacy messages is, is important. But I think this will all be part of the consideration. Yes, we always have backlash from different groups. But when we look at our countries, and I can speak for my country, we can see instances within our countries where temporary special measures have been made for men. They're made in such a way that men have benefited. And there was no complaint. So I think that um, the message crafting is also a very important aspect apart from the data and uh, the, the ultimate result message that this is, this is an initiative that will work for, well for the society as a whole, for development uh, and so on. Uh, each, each country would have its nuances. I just wanted to put that in there. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to keep the questions flowing and the discussion going, but um, I also think we need to um, keep to the time that we've agreed for today. Uh, we have been able to touch on um, some very specific issues, some specific recommendations, but also emphasizing in general the importance of understanding CEDAW um, holistically, understanding, um, familiarizing ourselves with the concluding observations, the, the general recommendations, the jurisprudence of the committee, so that we can really see how we can mobilize the tools available to us. Um, so I think we'll, we'll bring the conversation to a close for today. Um, we will send a follow-up email to participants and we will uh, look to collate the resources and information that people have been sharing in the chat um, and send you some links to some other information as well. Um, so at this point, on behalf of the Women's Human Rights Education Institute, I'd, I'd like to thank each of our panelists uh, for being here today to share their important insights into this conversation. Um, at the Institute, we are firmly of the belief that CEDAW is a vital mechanism for promoting gender equality and also a vital visionary framework for strengthening women's movements locally, nationally, regionally, and internationally, um, which doesn't necessarily require that you get on a plane and go to Geneva, <laughs> which is fortunate in these times because actually none of us can. So thinking about what the convention, the framework, what all of that means and how we, we work with that in our own respective areas. So we hope we can find myriad ways to continue this dialogue and to use CEDAW to organize ourselves to unite against the many challenges facing women's human rights defenders at this time. 
Um, I'd like to uh, give a call out also a special thanks to the support of CUPE, the Canadian Union of Public Employees and the Channel Foundation um, that support our work and have made this webinar possible today. Thank you to everybody amongst the attendees who has joined us. Uh, let's continue the dialogue. We will be announcing further webinars moving forward and be launching um, an online learning program um, in the next couple of weeks so you can keep in touch with us. Um, so thank you very much um, to all our panelists. Um, thank you, Laksha, for your work. And Laksha, I think you have a few final comments. Um, yes. Hi, thank you, everybody. Um, so we will be emailing everyone um, with the recording and also with any other resources that we might have. Uh, also, you can sign up for our newsletter on the website, which is learnwhr.org. And also follow us on social media and where we'll be making announcements for upcoming webinars and also online learning opportunities like Angela mentioned. And hopefully that way we can keep engaging in this conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for joining today. I put the website and the social media handles and um... Um, it's great that you could all connect in the chat space as well, and, and we like to facilitate those interconnections. Um, we don't share people's email addresses and whatnot without their consent, obviously. Um, so like I said, we'll send some follow up information and see um, how we can continue to engage. So thank you very much to everybody. Thank you. Panelists, if you want to unmute yourselves, if you have a final quick comment, if anybody needs to leave, um, if not, but... Um, I, I, I just want to say that we're going to try to do this same content, or at least uh, in Spanish. So for those of you who speak Spanish, to, to tell others that we'll, we're trying to, to talking to other CEDA members that speak Spanish to, to come on to talk this because it's, it's such an important issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.